You are listening to a Pleasure Podcast. For more from our Sex Podcast Collective, visit PleasurePodcasts.com. I'm Tristan Terramino, and this is Sex Out Loud. That's why I'm literally writing a whole book about my gender. My mom and I were on BBC together talking about sex work and disability, which is something I never thought I would ever do. Where do we learn about how to react to bodily fluids? People have abortions more than we want to admit, and abortion is beyond healthcare. It's really body autonomy. Someone talks about porn ruining sex. The question for me is, which porn? I don't want anybody to fetishize my Jewishness who wouldn't stand next to me at a march. I just wanted to show how polyamory in a way that looks like polyamory. If you're excited by sexual pleasure and sexual politics, you've come to the right place. I've been this radical, queer, agnostic theologian for a long time. They think that Muslims don't have sex. There is a very specific history of racism and anti-blackness in this country. I don't know who started this myth that after people are sexually assaulted, they never want to fornicate again. We really don't think that change happens without knowing what we're for and not just what we're against. Welcome to Sex Out Loud, everyone. Listen, embodiment, the word, the concepts, the idea, is something that has been a recurring theme in my circles in the past year. People writing about embodiment, people teaching about embodiment, and also talking about self-care and how the nervous system plays into the ways in which we interacts with people and are in relationship with people. So when my guest reached out to me, it was sort of like kismet. It was like, oh, wait, you do work on this? I've been thinking a lot about this. <laughs> so I was really glad. And it's someone I, I taught a class for her a hundred years ago when we were in diapers. <laughs> and so, um, so I knew her from long ago and now she's back. Let me tell you about her. Dr. Allison Ash is an, a trauma-informed sex and intimacy coach, an educator, a lecturer at Stanford University, author, and the founder of TurnOn.Love. A champion for others overcoming shame and deepening pleasure, Dr. Ash helps her clients experience the kind of sexual interactions and romantic relationships they long for. As a sociologist with a PhD from Stanford, Dr. Ash has a comprehensive understanding of the complex societal challenges that often lead to unsatisfying and disempowering sexual experiences. She also draws on her extensive training in the Hakomi method of psychotherapy, as well as somatica model of sex and intimacy coaching to support her clients to radically explore and courageously express themselves. Dr. Ash designs workshops, courses, and retreats and offers individuals and couples coaching to give others the tools to discover their desires and confidently pursue them. And if you want to look her up online, she's at turnon.love. Welcome to Sex Out Loud, Dr. Ash. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so glad to be here. Can I call you Allison? Yes. Or you can even call me Allie. Oh, Al, what? Now we're getting really, really intimate. intimate. Okay. We're we're getting intimate right off the bat. Great. This is, (laughs) this is a good, a good sign of things to come. Allie. So, um, First, will you tell me a little bit about your background and what brought you to this work? Sure. Yes, I'd be glad to. Well, let's see. I have a PhD in sociology where I specialized in in sex, gender, and sexuality. So my research looked at college hookup culture. Why were college women orgasming less often than college men from a social perspective? Um, looked uh, Looked at queer hookup culture and particularly how queer women were coming to their identities and first experiences. And a lot of research around also trans discrimination. So my early research kind of really spread wide around just looking at the ways that sex, gender, and sexuality are interrelated and how they can be formed by our really early and formative experiences and um, and the ways in which we can learn very actionable skills to increase our capacity to feel comfortable expressing ourselves authentically and feeling empowered to be able to um, pursue our desires. And so as I was doing this research, I started teaching undergrads and really decided that my passion was in teaching. 
And what I wanted to do was take some of the skills that I was realizing were really important and vitally missing, um, intimacy skills, communication skills, um, embodiment skills, which we'll talk about today, um, and give them to people um, in ways that I think just so many of my clients say, why didn't I have this when I was young? And it's just like that missing piece of education that we all need. And unfortunately, so few of us ever get. Yeah. Yeah. It's so funny because I love sociology and I know many sociologists and sociology, like people know so much about people (laughs) that I've often wondered why more coaches don't have a background in sociology. I guess uh, mostly you do research and, and teach. That's what most sociologists do. Yep. That's what most sociologists do. But I do think that being a sociologist offers a really interesting and important edge and perspective because so many of us feel like we are operating in a vacuum, right? Like anything that is our experience is our fault, our shortcoming, our not enoughness, our too much, (laughs) too muchness, right? Mm -hmm. And getting to just see how society is structured in these ways that really create disempowering experiences for everybody, including cis straight men, when it comes to intimacy. I think that when we can contextualize it and see how we're operating in a broader context, it actually can be deeply deshamifying. Yes, because you see the whole big picture and you know how important a role it plays. Right. And it's not any individual's fault or shortcoming. It's just so the ways that we are educated or not educated and socialized or not socialized to be. So you said, did you say unshamifying, deshamifying? Deshamify. Yeah. It's a favorite little phrase of mine. It's a favorite phrase of yours. So let's (laughs) talk about shame. Um, It is one of the most powerful emotions that shapes our sexuality. It's something that comes up again and again in my own work when people talk to me. Um, what, tell me the importance and the significance of shame, you think. H- how does it present in people's lives? And then how do we heal from sexual shame? Yeah, I really love the topic of shame because I think it's really per- pervasive. Um, one of the acronyms that I really appreciate for shame is should have already mastered everything. Mm. Mm-hmm. And it's just this idea that something's wrong with you or something's wrong with me, right? That there's Um, you know, it tends to fall in these categories of there's something that's too much or something that's not enough or some kind of shortcoming, lack of experience, or maybe certain experiences that I do have that are shame worthy. And the thing about shame is is that the fear of shame is rejection. That's why we experience shame is actually because when we were Hunter gatherers and tribal society, shame was really a advantageous and still is an advantageous emotion for society because it helps us be responsible for our behavior. It helps us keep ourselves in line and be responsive to social norms and to be caring and considering compassionate and, and thoughtful of other people. But shame gets Um, its own megaphone and takes over our inner stage and monologue and doesn't know how to let our other voices also have a turn. And, you know, we're not, we're not actually born with the voice of our inner critic, we develop it because the experience of being shamed is so excruciatingly painful and scary, that we rather shame ourselves first as our first line of defense to keep ourselves appropriate, I'm doing the air quotes that you can't see, Mm -hmm. (laughs) so that we can stay connected and belong. So really, you know, shame at its core has a really healthy purpose, but then it gets just totally contorted and used to beat ourselves up and to keep ourselves quite alone. Because actually what we do is we keep our shameful bits secret. Because we don't want people to know and reject us. But the antidote, as Brene Brown, who I just love, she's a wonderful shame researcher, says, the antidote to shame is to bring it out of the darkness and to share it with people or trusted few who are going to accept us in spite of the thing that we feel ashamed of. That's how we move through shame. And that's true whether it's sexual shame or any kind of shame. And you said this um earlier on this piece about norms, right? Shame is supposed to keep us in line um, so that we're, you know, so that we're acting out these norms that society tells us we should. 
And I think around sexuality, those norms are so rigid and so static Mm -hmm. and um, so sort of shallow with no depth that lots and lots of people fall outside of sexual norms. Yes. Have you ever heard of the myth of normality? No, but tell me. It's one of my favorite concepts, which is this idea that people only talk about what they perceive to be normal. But then it perpetuates this myth of what is actually normal. And the people who actually fall under the parameters of the socially understanded idea, concept of normal is actually abnormal. That so many more people fall outside of this myth of normality. We just don't know about it because we don't talk about it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, obviously, I've had the the privilege of talking to hundreds of maybe hundreds of thousands of people about their sex lives. And also I've watched people have a lot of sex, whether that's on porn sets or in private or at a play party or a sex party. And, you know, when people imagine this sort of mythical way that everyone's having sex and how they look and how it sounds and how long it lasts and what gets them off, you know, I haven't seen it. <laughs> <laughs> I That's haven't funny. seen it. Please show me, mm-hmm. show me that sex because it may be the bubble that I live in, but, um, but that's not what I see. And that's not what t- people tell me about. I know. And yet so many people are so c- stuck in their head, worried about what do I look like? What do I sound like? What do I smell or taste like? Am I doing it right? Are they mm-hmm. enjoying it or bored or tired or, you know, and it just takes us out of our body, which is just so perfect that we're talking about this. And takes us out of the present moment and our desires and our pleasure and our connection with the other person. Because when we're stuck in our head, um, it's just very isolating and disconnecting. Yeah, I think I take for granted at this point in my life that, that I sort of owe any kind of performance or anything to my sexual partners. I had sex yesterday and my pussy started feeling really sore. It just, it was a lot of penetration, just started feeling sore. And I was like, yeah, I think I'm done with that orifice today. And, you know, my partner was just like, oh, great, let's move on. Um, and so I think I feel really lucky that I, you know, I have the confidence to say, to listen to my body and say, hey, this isn't working. There, there isn't enough of the no, or this isn't working in sex. That's right. And I have to tell you, when I work with hetero couples, so many of the women are so worried about the impact of them sharing those kinds of things with their partner. And so many of the men are so hungry for that information. (laughs) They just want to know. They want it to be pleasurable for their partner and pleasurable for them. And they're just so hungry for those insights. Yeah. Yeah. I just wish more people you know, felt like they had a voice and felt like they weren't pressured to not say anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. And to, to, you know, on the flip side, also not take it personally as though you did something wrong, but rather learn how to redirect towards what else is there and what else is possible. And I think this is where the intersection between sex positivity and queer sex is really powerful because, you know, queer sex is so inherently nonlinear. Right. So that like if I say I am my pussy's done to my partner, they're not like, okay, sex is over. They're like, okay, cool. What else is possible? (laughs) Right. (laughs) Right. And I think that kind of creative thinking and also I'm not taking it personally as if something is wrong. Right. Right. um, That that positive redirection is just a game changer. Absolutely. Absolutely. So your latest project, you do all these courses, is this 10-week online course called Sexual and Emotional Intimacy Skills. And, you know, as I was looking at the curriculum, the thing that drew me in, as I said in the intro, uh, was this section on embodiment and nervous system care. I had um, several weeks ago the author of the book Polysecure on here. And it's an incredible book that looks at attachment theory, um, but attachment theory applied to polyamory. Mm, mm -hmm. And one of the things we talked about on the show was um, what it means for partners to co-regulate each other emotionally, which I thought was really, really, really interesting. Um, And there's there's some writing about that in the book. So I want to hear from you. Why the the embodiment piece? Why why this sense of we have to 
address our nervous system care. Why is that important to healthy intimacy and relationships? Yeah. And I I love that focus on co-regulation because it's an integral piece to both, um, well, certainly to nervous system care. And I think also to embodiment. So let's start with embodiment. Embodiment is that felt sense of what's happening in your body, often the sensations and the emotions. And even if you're really embodied, noticing the impact of the connections between your body and the outside world. So noticing how your body is responding to the breeze or to somebody's touch or gaze or to the feeling of being naked and exposed, right? Mm -hmm. And embodiment is a a form of mindfulness. And like any kind of mindfulness, um, it's a skill that we can practice and develop. And it's important to think about this skill because we're not taught it naturally in our thinking culture, right? In fact, oftentimes embodiment, particularly for men, is shamed and devalued. Um, it's thought of as sensitive and, um, and not as prized as the rational, thinking, logical brain. Um, but there's so much wisdom in the body, particularly when it comes to understanding your nervous system. That wisdom lives in our body. In addition to that, of course, also understanding your desires, your full capacity for pleasure, getting out of your head and being able to um, be more intuitive and in tune to your partner all comes from being more embodied. I mean, this this mm -hmm. resonates with me because I do feel like I'm someone who spends a lot of time in my head. And if I spend too much time there and I don't consciously go, wait, what's going on with my body right now? How do I feel? And I think for me, like dealing with chronic pain yes. has it's, it's, but it's a negative reinforcement because mm-hmm. dealing with chronic pain means I can't ignore my body. It, it shouts at me um, and it prevents me from doing things. But so I associate sort of being fully in my body often with pain, which is really tricky for me. I also suffer from chronic pain. So I feel you. And I think that one of the other consequences to that is that our bodies aren't always a pleasant place to be. So we develop as a very understandable protective strategy and coping mechanism uh, being in our heads. It's a, it's, a more, it's a more comfortable place to be sometimes if you're in a lot of pain in your body. Also true for trauma survivors, folks with gender dysphoria, a lot of body shame. You know, um, I, I often also have um, clients who've been in the military and for them being embodied is also very challenging because their body was often not a safe or comfortable place to be. Mm, no. And then it also occurs to me as you're talking that there are these external forces that can interfere with embodiment. I mean, I'm thinking of the fact that women's bodies, especially, and women with multiple marginalizations, their bodies are policed, are critiqued, are criminalized, are legislated, are controlled. And all of that has to impact how much you even feel ownership over your own body. That's right. That's right. And I I was watching this TED Talk the other day, and they were telling me that in the UK, you can legally have sex at either 16 or 17, but you cannot legally buy a dildo until you're 18. So what is that telling women about the right to their own pleasure, to exploring their own bodies, to um, like the, the order of operations here is so messed up. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's yeah. almost like, because also it's like you can't have a sexual relationship with yourself. That's right. Right. It's like, how is it that you can have, and what they mean, of course, is heterosexual sex, right? There, the assumption here is you can have heterosexual sex, but you can't necessarily just focus on your own pleasure. And how many sex ed classes are talking about masturbation for boys, but not for women, or don't talk about the anatomy of the clitoris? I mean, I am working with clients in their 40s and 50s that still don't understand the full anatomy of the clitoris. Most people don't. You know, it's a shame. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, okay, so what do you mean by when you talk about in in conjunction with embodiment, um, care for the nervous system? Yes. Um, I want to geek out with you for a quick second about trauma, because I think that that's really related to nervous system care. Is it okay if I go there? Yeah. My audience goes deep very fast, and we've had a lot of discussions about trauma on the show. Oh, perfect. Okay, great. So um, our automatic nervous system has the parasympathetic and sympathetic features, and the parasympathetic is responsible for rest and relaxation. 
And the sympathetic part of our automatic nervous system is responsible for go, 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 thinking, movement, doing, agency. And there is constant um, homeostasis that we have that's a balance between these two systems, okay? And if you can visualize um, the area between as kind of this window that is referred to as the window of tolerance, okay? And I say this um, because what I want to try and have you visualize is that there is basically an optimal operation zone for your nervous system. And when you are in this optimal operation zone in your window of tolerance, you have all of your capacities online. Your brain is fully functioning. You can have access to empathy and logic and reasoning and memory. And we are really at our best. And that homeostasis, that balance can get thrown by stress, by fighting in arguments, by getting in a um, car accident or somebody cutting you off on the road, um, by, by trauma, certainly, um, but not even necessarily uh, has to be trauma. It could just be these stressors on the system that put us out of our optimal zone and either have our sympathetic nervous system go on over overdrive, which when that happens, that can put us into fight or flight, which is a trauma response, or it can have our parasympathetic part of the nervous system go on overdrive, and that can result in more of a freezing or collapsing kind of response. And these responses are really advantageous if you are um, maybe going to be attacked or um, are in a life or death situation. But a lot of the time, most of the time, when we're responding um, in these ways, we're actually quite safe. We are just feeling very dysregulated in our system and we don't have the capacity to respond in a way that's more regulated or really with our full capacities. And so that's when we can fly off the handle, it's when we can be really short with our partner or get really stony and silent, or we can go um, just shut down and we don't, can't think of what we want to say, our brain just goes completely blank, um, or we want to um, push our partner or say an angry insult. Like All of these responses are protective um, strategies, but are not actually um, helping us stay in connection and they're not helping us foster intimacy. Okay. We're going to take our first commercial break. That's a lot to unpack. (laughs) Yes. And so everyone stay with us. We're going to now break all of that down, but first this commercial. Sleep. We all love it. And most of us are probably wanting more of it. But rather than getting a solid night's rest, we often find ourselves doom scrolling, checking email, all sorts of things that are definitely not relaxing. That's why I'm excited to partner with Calm, the app designed to help you ease stress and get the best sleep of your life. When you relieve anxiety and improve your sleep, you feel better in every part of your life. That's what Calm has done for me, in addition to supporting me in doing a mindfulness practice. They have lots of different resources from meditations and breathing exercises to soundscapes and sleep stories. Over 85 million people around the world use Calm to take care of their minds and get better sleep. And Calm makes a great gift for your loved ones, also a perfect last minute one. For listeners of the show, Calm is offering a special limited time promotion of 40% off a Calm premium subscription at calm.com slash Tristan. Get started today at calm.com slash Tristan for 40% off a premium subscription and new content is added every week. That's calm.com slash Tristan. It's time to take care of our minds. Welcome back to Sex Out Loud, everyone. I'm talking today with sex and intimacy coach and educator and sociologist, Dr. Allison Ash. Now, before the break, Allie, because I could call you Allie, you talked about all this nervous system stuff, but you talked about it in a really accessible way, by the way. So 
let me just disclose here that my optimum nervous system zone is a piece of two by four plywood in an ocean. I just came up with that. I was just like, what is the metaphor? How does one describe it? Um, yeah. So it's, uh, it's a, it's, it's a tiny little speck <laughs> in a sea of, uh, emotional dysregulation and, um, and fight, flight, freeze, fawn, fatigue, uh, oh, collapse. So this really, like, it appeals to me to just know more about how my nervous system works. Like that alone has been a key piece for me in just understanding kind of how I'm wired. Right. Right. And then understanding that we actually have a lot more agency over our nervous system than we think or are taught to know that we do. Um, well, because that, it feels viscerally like we have zero control. Exactly right. Exactly right. And in the moment when you are dysregulated, uh, oftentimes you don't have a ton of control. I mean, that's the whole nature of being dysregulated. But there are things that we can do to expand our window of tolerance, to expand that optimal zone so that we have more resiliency, um, that it takes more to throw us off of our seat. Um, and, and that we can care for our nervous system when we, um, both when we're regulated and when we're dysregulated, so that we're more um, nourished, so that we feel uh, um, more spacious and actually have more of a capacity to handle the daily stressors that just come at us all the time. Okay, so how do we do that care work? Yeah. Well, the first thing is the embodiment work, um, because it's so important to be able to notice what it feels like in your body when you're getting dysregulated. So if you think about your um, nervous system activation on a scale from one to 10, where one is just waking up after an amazing night's sleep without the alarm, the birds pleasantly chirping, just like the most peaceful, relaxed you can imagine. And 10 is screaming, fighting, pushing, punching, or totally collapsed, completely dissociated, not even present here, just like full on trauma zone. What we want to be able to do is be able to tune into our body and into our nervous system and notice how is my nervous system feeling right now? Like if I was to assign a number on that scale, would I even have a clue where I'm at? And what are the factors that give me that kind of information? So right now, as I'm talking to you and I'm tuning into my nervous system, I'm actually doing it with a moment of breath. I'm slowing down, scanning my body. And I can notice that there's quite a bit of activation in my body because I'm talking to you and there's some adrenaline rushing and I'm thinking and I'm um, I'm, I got kind of like some fun uh, excitement jitters. And so um, I'm noticing that maybe, okay, I might be like a, a four out of 10, right? So I'm not stressed, but there's some activation in my system. So it's helpful for me to be able to track that. That information is so important because then I know if I'm starting to get really dysregulated, what to do, to, that, that it's time to really get involved with nervous system care. Right. So as even as I've been talking with you, if I notice that I'm getting a little bit more activated, maybe my leg starts to shake a little bit or maybe my breath becomes a little bit more shallow or maybe I can notice I'm tensing my muscles a little bit, all signs of increasing activation. I'll just take some, some deeper breaths. I'll maybe put my hand on my chest, give myself some soothing touch. And these things are just some really subtle, subtle ways in, in the moment to just start to give some care to my nervous system. And so when we're thinking about care, that really then falls under two categories, which is self-care and um, co-regulation, which you referenced earlier in the segment, um, which is how do we um, soothe with another person our nervous system. And we need to actually, in order to have healthy nervous systems, be doing both, engaging in self-care activities and engaging in co-regulation. Okay. So this makes me think of my, my sort of obvious question, which is that what happens when both people are dysregulated at the same time, which by mm -hmm. the way, is often when people are having an issue or a conflict arises. Yes, definitely. 
So what if there is no sort of soothing figure in the room or in the conversation? Yep. Um, oftentimes taking space is really important. When my partner and I are both dysregulated, I will j- take a shower um, and a long one. Um, that's helpful for me. Taking a walk around the block. Um, if, if we're not too dysregulated, sometimes we can put whatever is the topic that feels really tense and, and, and stressful on the shelf and just cuddle or engage in something that feels a little bit more lighthearted, like something silly, some attention out can be really helpful, some, something playful. Um, but you don't always have access to that. That might feel really disingenuous and just not possible. And in those cases, engaging in self-care is vital so that you can come back into a place where you're more able to have some co-regulation with your partner again. Yeah. And I think, well, you said it, you said it's a practice, right? So I don't think people, I don't think people out there, you're supposed to get it like right away. Like the next fight you have totally regulate your nervous system. Um, but it, you have to keep practicing it over and over. And there are times when you can access it. And there are other times when you still can't. A hundred percent. And I really think the key is to notice when you're getting dysregulated and to take breaks and to pause to see if you can do that before the fight even happens. And yes, of course, if the fight happens, if you're dysregulated, take those breaks, take the space, come back. Um, I have a whole workshop called The Road to Reconnection, which is about how to do repair work. And there's a massive section about just even when to do it. And that's really about noticing your level of activation and doing it when you're in your window of tolerance. So often we're trying to have these repair conversations when we're dysregulated and we're totally disadvantaged in those moments to do it. Um, uh, But then also I think part of it is, yeah, just taking frequent breaks, um, pausing, slowing down the pace of talking. Um, All of those things can help us have these kind of tenuous conversations in a way that doesn't throw us out of our window of tolerance. Um, at all, or we just take those breaks sooner rather than when we're fighting, but just when we notice, hey, I think I'm reaching my limit for this for this part of the conversation. You know, there's been a lot of talk about Zoom fatigue just because we're in a pandemic and a lot of people are on Zoom and other platforms for work. They may be on it for eight hours. They also want to see loved ones. And I'm wondering what your thoughts are on how we can both know our own selves, but also how we can read other people when we're not in the same room? Yes. Oh, I love that question. Um, You know, eye contact is really key. And eye contact is interesting on Zoom because people's cameras aren't always where they're looking, aren't always where their screens are. And so eye contact can feel a little bit tricky, Mm -hmm. but you can still notice, are they engaged with their eyes or are their eyes scanning all over the computer? Like they might not be actually on Zoom, but they're surfing the internet or are their eyes not even on the computer at all? Um, So that can be something that you can track body posture? Are they like leaning in and engaged or are they like just kind of slumped over um, and or maybe like kind of barriered with their arms crossed? Um, but often it's even in tone and thinking about how we can do this on the phone where we're not even seeing somebody. Mm-hmm. Um, their level of excitement, enthusiasm versus kind of maybe disengagement or exhaustion or shorter responses. And I think the thing with Zoom fatigue and just virtual connection fatigue in general is to um, to remember not to take it personally, because it's um, and for so many people the nourishing aspects of connection are so much harder to tap into in those moments of being yes. on Zoom or on the phone. Yes, and so it's not you; it's the technology. Right we've spent so much time on it now and maybe for the near future, the foreseeable future, I find that it's just harder sometimes to interact, right? They're just cues that you can't get. You can't feel like the energy in the room with a group. That's right. Yeah. And that, that feeling of that collective effervescence, right? Like that your energy and my energy and somebody else's energy are adding in and then we're feeding off of this co-created thing that you get at sporting events or dance parties or religious events, right? That, that, mm-hmm. that is a really important form of co-regulation 
that we're really missing. So when we think about nervous system care, you know, one of the things I want to tell listeners is that there are exercises that you can do both for embodiment, both by yourself and with somebody else. And then there's a bunch of self-care activities that you can do. And I have handouts for both of these on my website, available for free. If you go to turnon.love and then more and then resources, they're in there in the list of handouts. And I want to make sure that folks have access to this because um, I think that it's a really good goal, especially as we're moving into the holiday season where either there's the normal holiday stress and family dynamics or there's the added stress of isolation and the lack of connection and the traditions that mean so much to you. I think that it's really a good idea to find some of these self-care options. I have 25 on this handout that work for you and be engaged in them every day. So whether it's meditating or journaling or gardening or taking a bath or shaking or napping, like whatever it is that does it for you, that you're doing it as this idea of kind of just like baseline foundational care for myself so that I can handle the fatigue of having to connect in ways that aren't nourishing or as nourishing as I know they could be, the grief of not getting to have the connection in the ways that we want, Um, those of us that aren't able to co-regulate because we don't have access to the same kinds of connection, um, I think that um, that knowing that we we can engage in activities that can soothe us, and oh, and here's the other important thing to remember is that many of these things aren't going to sound appealing on the forefront. You're going to be in a crappy mood, and you're not going to want to do any of these things. And just like working out, and oftentimes just like sex, once you start doing it, then the desire for it and the pleasure and the enjoyment for it comes online. Yeah, this is exercise for me. I know it's good for me. I never want to freaking do it. I always feel better after I do. (laughs) I've never had a time when I've exercised and been like, now I feel worse. (laughs) That's right. That's right. And and that's true for oftentimes self-care activities, because if you're feeling really just out of sorts, it's hard to imagine that taking a bath is going to make much of a difference. Right. And it's not going to be the cure-all, but these things do have a cumulative effect. And it's important to think about how we can just continually attend to our, our nervous system. Well, and also, so there's also a weird thing going on right now, um, as we're all on various levels of lockdown, where I think there's an assumption that you have to pick up the phone when the phone rings. Um, You have to attend every like family Zoom meeting. In other words, you're at home, so you have nothing else to do. Like, what is the barrier? You you know, you sort of, you know, and, and I think that's like extra pressure. And to say, hey, I'm going to like go to that Zoom family thing for the first half hour. And then the next half hour, I'm going to log off and like take a bath or take a shower Mm -hmm. Um, could be really healthy. And and I also want to say that um, I use my dog for this when visiting people. Because I think also when you're staying with people, everything gets heightened because you often don't have like your own space or you're in their space. So my purse dog really comes in handy. I have a chihuahua. His name is Bodhi. And when I bring him with me, um, he's a way for me to have explainable timeouts, <laughs> right? So in other words, I have to take him out, right? The dog has to go out. So I'm, <laughs> I'm going to go on a 15-minute walk. And no mm-hmm. one has to question like, no, we want you here. We want you playing the game. I want to be like talking to you the whole time you're here. It's like n- the dog needs to go out. I'm going to just take a walk. Um, and so Mm -hmm. it's just like it, so no one's feelings get hurt, but I can absolutely kind of conjure it up and be like, I I actually have to leave right now. (laughs) Yeah. And I think that it's just, I I love that. And I think that I want everybody to feel like they have access to just saying, I am feeling a little bit overwhelmed or "I, I need a moment to just come back home to myself, or I need a moment of quiet. I need a moment of respite. I'm going to go take a walk or I'm going to go sit quietly in the other room or I'm, you know, and, and just to normalize that. <laughs> um, and I think especially around the holidays as we're with family and it can just be so overwhelming to give ourselves those breaks. I don't know if you've seen the show um, Life in Pieces. It's a really funny half hour comedy show. It's now available on Amazon Prime. I was not paid to say that. Just really enjoying it as a nice 
joy lifter. And one of there's this, it's about this big multi-generational family and the wife of one of the brothers in the family often gets kind of overwhelmed during these big family gatherings. And so she started telling people that she was going to go meditate. And the family as it was, and the culture of the family was like, oh, meditation, that's beautiful. It's healthy. It's so good. Of course, like get up in the middle of the meal, like whenever you want to go, like go in another room and meditate. Now, of course she wasn't meditating, but she was actually just giving herself like a timeout. <laughs> mm-hmm. And because of the way the family responded to it, you know, she didn't say, I need to go have a timeout or I need to go play games on my phone because you people are driving me insane. She said, I have to go meditate, but then quickly the family caught on and then everyone was going to meditate because everyone wanted a timeout. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what this makes me think of. Yeah, it's a funny show. It's a funny show. <laughs> well, and what I really love that that's alluding to is just how um, empowering it is to see somebody do that. I, I just know I've done that and people have been like, I've, I feel so encouraged to do that myself now or thanks for the permission. I permission. Really, mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it's I mean, we all do want to take those breaks. Yeah, but we have to normalize it. I mean, the, 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 the underneath of this is that she couldn't just say, God, I'm overwhelmed. Can I, I'm, I just need to go and have a time out, <laughs> right? right? Like we have to normalize that also, just being straightforward and honest about it um, in the, when it's appropriate and when you feel safe enough to do that, obviously. And maybe that's actually one of the hidden blessings of COVID, if I dare say that phrase, is that I think everybody just understands that people are overwhelmed that we don't have access to the same level of resources that bring us joy and soothing to our nervous system, that we're all um, stressed and dealing with things that we never imagined having to deal with. And, um, and I think that there's something that's just so understandable about saying, I'm really overwhelmed right now. Mm-hmm. And actually that level of vulnerability is what creates intimacy. And it's deeply de-shamifying because if you're saying I'm overwhelmed and not responding to it as though that's problematic, but just something to take care of. Not judging yourself or suppressing it. Right. Exactly. Then that gives permission for the other person to not assume that there's something wrong with them when they feel overwhelmed. It's great. That's really, really great things to think about and to chew on. Okay. We're going to take our next commercial break. When we come back more with Dr. Allison Ash. So don't go anywhere. The holiday season can bring feelings of stress, anxiety, even loneliness this year more than ever. And when you're feeling overwhelmed, pleasure is often the first thing that gets overlooked, even though it's exactly what might help most. Make your sexual wellness a priority with Dipsy and start feeling like yourself again. Dipsy is an audio app full of short, sexy stories designed to turn you on. Each Dipsy story features authentic characters and immersive scenarios, so you feel like you're right there. Find stories about an off-limits hookup with your professor, or a costume party that takes things to the new level, or one where your partner tells you exactly what to do or you try a new toy together. Dipsy also has wellness sessions to help you learn more about yourself and bedtime stories and soundscapes to help you relax before you drift off. That's right, people. Sleep has come to Dipsy. Well, technically, Dipsy could have already been playing a big role in your sleep. I mean, let's face it. One way to fall asleep is to masturbate. Um, And Dipsy is great to inspire your solo sex and your orgasm. But now they've also got bedtime stories, which feature classic Dipsy storytelling, but a little less explicit to just let your mind wander and you drift off into some nice sleep. And for listeners of the show, Dipsy is offering a 30-day free trial when you go to dipsystories.com slash Tristan. That's a 30-day free trial. When you go to D-I-P-S-E-A stories.com slash Tristan. Dipsystories.com slash Tristan. This also makes a great gift, people. Welcome back to Sex Out Loud, everyone. I'm talking today with Dr. Allison Ash, and you should check out her 10-week online series, 
This also makes a really great gift and one that you can purchase in a matter of minutes without leaving your house. Mm-hmm. And there's no shipping involved. Um, it's called sexual and emotional intimacy skills. It's part of several courses that she has on her website, turnon.love. So I wanted to talk about, because the name of your site is Turn On, which implicates and implies desire. So I want to talk a little bit about desire, um, how you discover your desires, how you communicate your desires, how you get your desire needs met. Yes, I love talking about desire. It's one of my favorite topics for sure. And, um, and it ties in really beautifully because desire lives in our body. And so oftentimes being embodied will help you notice um, broadly what your desires are, but also how your desires are changing in real time. So I'm having sexy time with my partner. Something's not feeling quite right. I notice it's not feeling quite right. Can I turn into my body and notice what am I longing for? What, What kind of touch am I craving instead? And then redirect that sexual experience towards what I'm wanting instead. And that's a very embodied present in the moment understanding of our desires um which which relates to but is slightly different than kind of this broader more macro understanding of our desires which can be related to fantasies and a uh, broader turn ons those kinds of things and do you think everything that we ingest in our society has an impact on our fantasies you know i think that particularly when we're younger um that we uh, oftentimes fantasize to deal with experiences that are hard to deal with, um, emotional experiences. And that can oftentimes really form our like core erotic desires. So, you know, maybe if you felt like you were always fighting for attention and you didn't really get enough attention from your parents or between your siblings, you might really fantasize about being chosen or being sought after or being prized or, you know, that oftentimes when I think about desires and fantasies, I really get curious around what is the emotion there that you're looking to feel? Mm -hmm. What is that? What is that fantasy really satisfying? Because then it blows up your creative potential for thinking about what are the multitude of ways of getting that feeling met. Because sometimes you think you want one thing, like someone's like, I want anal sex. Anal sex is what I want. And if you can dig a little deeper, especially when there are sexual incompatibilities with partners, I have, I teach a class on how to plan a gangbang and I'm (laughs) single-handedly trying to redefine the gangbang and just get rid of and shed all of these sort of stereotypes and tropes of the gangbang and think of a gangbang merely as a group of people centered around being sexual with one person who I call the one. And what I talk about in that workshop is when you're like planning and thinking about what kind of gangbang, because I'm going to argue there's multitudes of gangbangs, not just this one that we've sort of grown up seeing and knowing. Um, When you're deciding like what your gangbang is, I want to know how you want to feel, like how you want to feel during, how you want to feel after. You know, do you want to feel adored? Do you want to feel worshipped? Do you want to feel taken? Do you want to feel used? Right? These are all different different states. And that can actually guide then the whole vibe and the whole structure of how the gangbang then unfolds. If you can identify what you want to feel. That's exactly right. And and similarly, you know, if I really crave anal, but for whatever reason, I'm not able to have anal sex, maybe I can look underneath that and say, oh, what I really want to feel is dominated. And I want to feel kind of used or I want to feel um, naughty, right? And then that can open up, okay, well, if anal sex isn't available for whatever reason, what are some other ways that I can get that feeling um, which is is really powerful because you know in the case that you gave it can help reformulate how we think about things that might have been formerly taboo or in you know in an, in another case when it feels like there's incompatibilities it actually helps you discover where you might you know where you might be compatible that you didn't think you were one of my friends once said um whenever you think you have incompatible needs, it's often just a crisis of imagination. And I really loved that. Oh, I love that. I love just um, the notion of imagination and sex. Cause I think we all need to expand our sexual imaginations 
And that's often what queer and kinky people do and non-monogamous people do. Mm -hmm. Uh, I love that. It's just a crisis of imagination, right? Well, and also it's, it's somehow to really oversimplify it. It's like, if it's about anal and it's not about anal, right? right. (laughs) So so sometimes it's like, it's, it, it is the thing that you want, the thing that feels good in your body, the thing that turns you on, the thing that makes you calm. And also it's a stand in for some other stuff. That's right. And, you know, you might still grieve not being able to have anal sex because of your broken tailbone injury or whatever else it might be. But it doesn't mean that you don't get that that nourishing sexual experience of feeling taken, if that's what it is. If that's what it is. Right, right, right. Okay, so tell me, we've, we've, we honed in on this sexual and emotional intimacy skills. We honed in on this one piece of embodiment and nervous system care. But give me a broader sense of what people can expect from this course. Um, so we go, we have a 10 week course. Um, this is actually the same class that I offer at Stanford university. I've just been so inspired by the experience of teaching there. I want to offer it to the public at large. And so, um, the course goes over consent and boundaries, embodiment, nervous system, care skills for emotional depth and safety, flirting, seduction, and expressing desire skills for maximizing pleasure. We talk about masturbation, which is really important for intimacy skills, orgasms and sex toys, uh, erotica fantasies, unpacking shame. We do talk about how to navigate intimacy in the COVID era, whether you're single or partnered. We talk about conflict and repairing relationships and also how to pick partners and end relationships. And this course is great if you're single, or partnered or monogamous or non-monogamous, the material is applicable. And in fact, oftentimes my students have said that it's impacted their experiences with their families and their housemates and friends, not just their sexual and intimate relationships. Well, right. We know that. We know that if you can, if you can develop a sense of yourself and what you want, that can translate from out of the bedroom to all the other parts of your life. Um, I just think that one of the upsides, if we're going to talk about upsides of COVID again, one of the upsides is that now people can reach like a worldwide audience. I could take a course with someone teaching it from Australia and I don't actually have to go to Australia. And so technology has now allowed us to do this so that people don't have to go to Stanford to take this course. And so it's just available to a lot more people. And I do think it makes a really good gift. Um, It's like giving therapy to someone is a gift. That's right. (laughs) Therapy (laughs) is a fucking gift, people. (laughs) I don't think it costs money. So like, it's like, (laughs) this is a thing that you can give someone that's going to be really a meaningful experience. Because I also think giving people experiences is a great gift. Yeah, I think you. I agree. And, you know, I just it's hard to argue with investing in your own self-care and well-being and happiness. And, you know, there's far few things better to invest in than yourself. Yeah. And we've got some time now. People have more time. They're not commuting. <laughs> they have, you know, if you have kids, you, you have less time, but some people have a little bit more time because we're quarantined. Um, okay. Well, I really want to thank you for being on the show. I just really appreciate you and the work that you do. Thank you. You're so fun to speak with. It's really been a total joy. So again, the website for you to find out about this course and others is turnon.love. And you can also find out about Dr. Ash at turnon.love on Instagram and on Facebook. I want to thank my engineer and editor, A-Rod at FTC Designs. You can follow him. You can hire him. You can pay him by going to Twitter at FTC underscore designs. New episodes go up on podcast platforms on Mondays. I am on social media across all platforms at Tristan Terramino. And the next time I talk to you, many holidays will have passed, specifically the winter solstice and Christmas. So happy holidays, everyone. <laughs>